continuing our morning uh, session, we will continue to focus on Chunyangjan, but in Western languages, English and French. And I'm sure by the end of the day, you'll be all experts on Chunyang, the tale of Chunyang. <laughs> um, all right, so um, our next speaker, um, I had the pleasure to, oh, before that, actually, um, this afternoon session was to be moderated by uh, my, co my colleague, co-convener of the Hamus Colloquium, uh, Richard Granker, but he could not make it uh, to this uh, event. Well, actually, he's been uh, one of the uh, one of the co-conveners from the very beginning uh, with Yonggi, and uh, this is the first time out of 25 years. This is the first time that he missed uh, this colloquium uh, due to family emergency. His um, father-in-law uh, passed away, unfortunately, and so that's uh, the reason why uh, he could not make it. So um, now I, uh, I took over his um, role and uh, I'll be moderate, moderating the uh, afternoon session. Um, so I, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Janet Lee, who is an assistant professor of Korean literature at Kaemong University. Uh, she received her PhD from UCLA and a student of Peter Lee, and um, she will be she uh, she focuses uh, her dissertation uh, focuses on love sickness, which is called sangsapyeong in Korean. And actually, <laughs> this, um, I, I don't know whether there's, uh, you know, this uh, in the concept of sangsapyeong uh, in the West, uh, but this sangsapyeong, love sickness, is actually key in this uh, tale of Chunyang. And so uh, we have, uh, uh, we're very delighted to have uh, Professor Lee here with us today. Uh, so I'll, uh, without further ado, I'll, uh, Turn the floor to Professor. So thank you very much for um, having me in this wonderful venue. We I uh, was kind of honored to work with all distinguished scholars working on the pre-modern Korea and modern Korea literature. Um, also, I'm. We especially appreciate all the supports and generous like a sponsorship from the Hanguk Kagyongsa GW and also Professor Kim Jisoo Kim and Professor Kim Nod. Uh, I'm so honored to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about English translations of Chunhao. Um, so I titled in the beginning the duality of text and translation. So this is much more about the translation studies, um, but also is about the tale of Chunhao. So I hope it's kind of uh, kind of kind of pique some interest to you. Um, and yes, first of thing, um, when I, when I come across this idea of a translation, um, well, which not does not mean just simply just uh, translating one word to another, one or one expression to another. It involves actually interpretation. So this idea of interpretation involved in the translation. It's kind of connected, um, but I actually this kind of um, this um, actually found a very interesting like uh, folding screen uh, recently, and it struck me this idea or made me to come back to this notion of interpretation. So this is kind of ten panel folding screen I found. Uh, looks like uh, we don't um, actually it's very hard to date back, but. Many scholars believe that this is a work of early modern um, around the colonial uh, period. Um, so when you look at this uh, paintings, um, the folding screen, uh, we, uh, the very first one is about the encounter between Mong Yong and Chun Hyang. Um, the second one is about the kind of midnight rendezvous between them. And third one is kind of looks like uh, their Meng Yong is bidding a uh, farewell to the Chun Hyang and is going up to the capital. And fourth one is well, kind of jump this kind of narrative, and uh, this is more about the Meng Yong coming back to the Namon. And fifth one is uh, the Chun Yang is being kind of persecuted by the the arrival of a new magistrate. Now the six to ten screen. So when it comes to six one, uh, it is about the imprisonment of Chunhyang, and seven and eight is kind of uh, about the new magistrate uh, celebrity of the kind of party, a party of his birthday party, and now the the you know, is kind of reveals his identity as a secret world inspector and coming back, and interestingly this 
folding screen, um, Koi, in this very last scene, the very last panel is portraying the wedding ceremony between Chunyang and Mengyong. So uh, this is a coin, oh, this is the triumphant moment of Chunyang, right? Uh, so she actually won this game, right? Um, but uh, interestingly, there's another uh, version of, more modern version of this folding screen of a Chunyang Do. So I'm sorry, it's kind of a little blurry, but probably can notice color is, we have more colors in the folding screen. Um, and we also find more intimacy developed between the Mengyong and Chunyang in the very first two parts. And um, also, uh, we saw uh, this part, um, I found the relevance, I tried to kind of identify the relevance between the narrative story and these visual images. And according to this version, it's more about, we can, uh, maybe the readers can be reminded of the famous repertoire, uh, like uh, inserted in this narrative text. So each panel kind of relating to the famous repertoire inserted in this um, text. So um, going back to uh, the ideas of translation, well, it looks like this, in a sense, the Chunyang is resembles Cinderella story. Um, so it's kind of tale of mistreated young woman who happens upon opportunity to marry well and escape her situation. So kind of plot of pursuing the romantic marriage has been used as source material uh, in many other cultures as well. Um, and also, uh, Tale of Chunyang has delivered a kind of very similar message, but I found this Chunyang contains more defiant political message as well, because Chunyang's marriage kind of above her social position uh, kind of present a very serious challenge to the nor cultural norms, and a courageous rebellion demonstrate the popular desire to subvert the prevailing the social hierarchy of chosen society. So in translation of Tale of Chunyang, the reader can see kind of swings of pendulum of interpretation between the ubiquitous theme of love and also emancipatory message of political change. So a translation is not only bridging these two heterogeneous worlds, but actually opens up the new possibilities and challenges to pre-existing condition. So, it's, um, so the translator can um, play down the cultural distinctness, such as local practices and so on, but at the same time, he can highlight the exotic elements, such as a kisen, or a kind of way to provoking uh, the reader's interest. So in considering the translator's flexible position, um, I want to examine the distance between um, the source text and target text by looking at the rhetorical strategies uh, employed in the two English translation, uh, the uh, mo most early earlier version of English translation coming out in the late 18th century uh, till uh, late 19th century to early 20th centuries. Um, so, and looks like there are more versions. Um, so it looks like we have four uh, different type of English translation. So first English translation was conceived by the horse Allen. Uh, he was an American missionary in Korea at the turn of 20th century. And he was a medical missionary as well and closely associated with King Kojong. Um, and um, so he actually made very interesting notes and records concerning his own experience in Korea, uh, but so he was also very active in translating Korean text. Um, second translation is done by the James Scarth Gale. Uh, recently, we find uh, we can find many studies and researchers, uh, researchers uh, concerning this James Gale's contribution to Korean studies. Um, um, looks like he uh, left for Korea as kind of a missionary volunteer with the YMCA and from 90, 80, uh, 1888 until the 1927, he lived in the Wonsan, uh, and there he served as board of the official translator of the Korean Bible. Um, and he also translated Chunhyang uh, in, uh, and published it in the Korean magazine. It's kind of chronicle that targeted Anglo-American uh, residents in Korea. 
this is his picture with looks like the Gale's products is also uh, kind of begets, um, well, could be supported by the group of scholars who, who work on the Korean literature, the Korean scholars, who's kind of, they work together. And this is um, kind of picture of the Korea magazine. So uh, in my uh, presentation, I would focus on the first, first two work, the Allen's translation and Jail, uh, James Gale's translation. And thirdly, we have another uh, translation uh, it's by the Richard Rods. Uh, he was Anglican bishop, but re uh, also he became kind of Roman Catholic priest in retirement. Um, so he actually provided more annotated and expanded version. Um, and his translation kind of reflects kind of increasing awareness of the Korean culture and the growth of Korean studies overseas. Uh, so his work came out in 1974. And uh, his version attempt to kind of preserve the Korean uh, culture specific terminologies uh, by highlighting the historical backgrounds and providing annotation to the original text and he also used um, Kun Wai Shower Romanized the Asian system for untranslatable Korean words. First translation is by my advisor, uh, Peter Lee. Um, uh, so he uh, published his translation of the major lyrics embedded in the text uh, in this uh, magazine, uh, Azilia. And so his base text was a Chonju edition, uh, the Wampan. And in addition to providing um, kind of a faithful translation, he tries to establish a sense of the rhyme uh, scheme of the original songs and also the structure of their lyrics. So uh, I want to go back to my um, the focus of to the translation by um, uh, Horace Allen and James Gale, and and kind of centering my work is centering on this earliest translation. Um, because this translation is kind of very important. It's very first work of uh, in English. At the same time, um, this also reflects a very, uh, very important time for the Korean history, the political turmoil with uh, during the 19th, late 19th century and early 20th century. So, um, so uh, back to uh, my points. I I want to kind of understand how the story has been uh, transferred. Uh, to the modern setting in English and convey the theme of the faithful womanhood um, in a given locality. So I titled uh, the second part of this presentation as an androcentric approach. So I found more male-centered uh, ideas in um, Allen's translation. So in 1889, the Horace Allen published a literary collection entitled Korean Tales, um, with kind of intent to uh, introduce popular Korean folk tales and stories uh, to English-speaking audience. He translated several others, including Kyunwa uh, Jinyo, The Weaver Girl and the Cowherd, Hungbo Nolbo, and Shincheong and Hongildong, kind of very famous story in Korea. And his project also in, contains a translation of Chunhyangjang. Um, the translation focus on kind of more focus on the perspective, the Mongyong. So uh, Mongyong's origin and heritage and social status are introduced from the beginning of the tale. In the translation, uh, Mongyong and his valet, Pangja, go on an excursion to Kwanghalu where he is kind of captured by uh, his vision of a woman uh, that was a Chunhyang. And, uh, and interestingly, we see kind of an overbearing uh, kind of male gaze uh, in this particular scene. So he is standing on the pavilion, and uh, he actually see the Chunhyang, but Chunhyang usually in the other versions is kind of a scene swinging uh, outdoors uh, as a kind of way of celebrating a town of festival. But in this translation, her presence at home kind of um, invokes the voyeuristic view uh, kind of augmented by the limited visual visibility of the female figure. And this is um, the way the Pangda introduces about Chunhyang to the Mongyong. And this quote actually shows 
the hierarchical kind of relationship between the Mongyong and Chunhyang, and the male response, uh, like uh, quotes, uh, have her sing and dance for me, end quotes, uh, corresponds with the translation's identification of Chunyang as kind of public dancer. So they trans he, he translated Kizang as a kind of public dancer in this text. Um, so, but it's quite different from the other version. The other version often emphasized Chunyang's upper class origin by suggesting her alleged father was a former magistrate. So while Meng Yong is kind of characterized by the youthful attributes of mobility and restlessness, Chunyang is a kind of very charming and prudent woman, uh, but much more wary about her vulnerable status as Kizeng. So her inner thoughts are revealed by narrator who states she has, quotes, uh, regrets in her proud spirit that fates have placed her in a profession where she was expo expected to entertain nobility, whether it suited her or not, end quote. However, the Meng Yong finds very simple answer for Chunyang's conundrum. To persuade her, the Meng Yong first writes out a pledge to, faithful, to be a faithful husband. Then he enters into his father's office and secretly removes Chunyang's name from the list of Kizeng. So here the translator adds a new element um, to the story by describing how Kan Meng Yong once set her free from the shackle of dancing girls. And this allows him to be depicted as a savior who wields the power to remove Chunyang's predicaments. Furthermore, the translator takes the liberty of reconstructing the story as kind of a building's Roman genre. So would you concentrate on development of the central character? So narrative often deals with protagonist journey from the youth to psychological or emotional maturity. So but the maturity can be achieved through the process that protagonist leaves home and undergoes kind of stages of conflicts and finally finds the best place to use uh, his or her talents. So translation also follows such a pattern by simplifying Meng Yong's new journey, uh, accompanying his father who was promoted as Secretary of Finance. But Meng Yong uh, in this moment moans, quote, my heart is almost broken now. I cannot bear it. I wish I could always be springtime, but this is only like the cruel winter that lingering um, in the mountain sometimes sweep down the valley and dries up the spring and kills the blossom, end quote. So here, the separation from the Chunyang uh, is kind of seen as a quest for the meaning of life or as a vehicle to facilitate his transition from the carefree boy to the mature man. Eventually, the unexpected departure and journey kind of furnished the Meng Yong with the strength and maturity to devote his career. So now he returns to the southern provinces as a secret of the royal inspector, and now his new duty is looking after the people. So in translation, the translation itself often emphasized the new magistrate Pyeon's on his behavior and his maltreatments of his subjects. Um, also, we can see the commoner's dread of exploiter the magistrate Pyeon and skepticism about the ruling class. Um, so translator, uh, translation also notes that um, the Pyeon's uh, misbehavior, but in contrast to Pyeon, Meng Yong is kind of depicted as the man pays more attention to people's agony and understand their anger, quotes. He walked away meditating. He here is a Meng Yong, and Meng Yong had placed himself down on the people's level and began to fall with them, end quote. This also portrays Meng Yong as having the quality of a strong leader who can relieve people's burdens. So in the story, with the appearance of new magistrate, Pyeon, uh, we can assume the love triangle in the story uh, among Chunyang and Meng Yong and uh, Pyeon, who compels Chunyang to serve him. Uh, but however, in this translation, 
um, we see no rivalry kind of form between the two male protagonists. Uh, whether the female figure is kind of function as a pivot to construct the asymmetry between the two male characters. So Kyun is kind of associated with the desolate um, and devoted himself to uh, the evious things instead of caring for the welfare of the people. But Moon Young is depicted as that of kind of redeemer who established the social justice. So finally, the ending uh, is very interesting uh, when I say this translation, kind of reveals the original text where uh, the text commemorates Chunyang for upholding her chastity uh, despite her position as a public dancing girl by elevating her status to the equal of that of her husband's Yangban status. However, in tr translation, the centrality of male protagonists uh, is more prevailing. So Mong Yong's courtship and journey and social success are shaped into fit the building's Roman structure. So Alan's translation is kind of viewed as a, like a tailor carefree and immature male figure uh, who finds love and matures and fulfills the ideal norms to become a qualified leader. Um, so this kind of male-centered narrative and translation is partly due to the original text. Um, so recently it's revealed to be the Gyeongpan 23장본, so the sole edition of 23 word blocks. Um, so while the Cheonju edition, Wanpan, so-called Wanpan, is tend to incorporate the various elements um, drawn from the folk and shaman and popular songs, but the sole editions involve a fewer improvisation and much less affected uh, by the musical elements. And because sole editions were circulated in the capital, they actually target the male elites as their main consumer. So the rise of the urban, the male yangban as a uh, consumer kind of reshaped the storyline to emphasize the male's success, both as sweeter uh, and officer. And consequently, Alan's version is inclined to reflect the male point of view entrenched in the source text. But in this telling, the female figure's emotional and physical pain, suffering, and sacrifice are marginalized, and her embodiment of faithfulness is less dominant. And the translation de-emphasized the theme of Chunyang as a faithful wife. Instead, focus is on Mong Yong's life path to enhance the text's readability uh, for English-speaking audience. So in this quote, we see the little difference between the original text and the elements take on. So in the original text, uh, Chunyang is become a uh, kind of paragon of the virtue, the Confucian virtue. But uh, in the great Alice translation, we see Mong Yong is more commemorate, commemorated, and Chunyang is more, uh, her, her kind of significance is more relating to her motherhood. Now, secondly, I want to talk more about uh, James Gale's translation. Um, James Gale was one of the founding the missionary in Korea during the Enlightenment period, uh, roughly from the, in 1880 uh, to 1910. So when it comes to 1917, uh, Gale began to translate uh, Okjunga. So Okjunga is a modern version of traditional Chunhyang, so rewritten by a fiction, new fiction writer, Shin Sozor Zaka, uh, Lee Hejo. Um, so Gail took this version as his source text entitled his translation as Chun Yang. But unlike the flower in prison, Gail divided his version into 24 chapters and serialized it in the Korea magazine from December 1917 to July 19, uh, 1918. Um, Gale's translation strategy kind of resembles that of free translation. Uh, this is my uh, a copy of the microfilm uh, housed in the uh, Jurong Gosoan. 
Uh, I own mine with a yellow. Uh, please, I hope you don't mind about it. Uh, <laughs> uh, in the bottom, we see uh, the letter that Mo Myung Won sent to China, starting from the bottom of this page. Uh, but we also see the PS there, postscripts. So we see uh, the way he, the Alan took this original version, he actually adds more Western uh, elements and doesn't mind about it. Um, so Gail's kind of strategy, she he kind of preferred more the free translation rather than a faithful translation word to word. So his, this kind of idea is also reflected in his translation Bible into Korean. So he believed that translator should be given a great latitude of expression and preferred insertion of parallels uh, from the Western history to facilitate his reader's comprehension of a text context of the stories. So it is also noted that the source text itself uh, integrates modern elements and includes points that diverge from the tradition. So he has a rendition itself. Uh, we see a class stratification is quite undermined in he has a virgin and also see the other elements as well. So Moon Young's parents are quite very supportive of their son's secret marriage. And another, another example would be uh, kind of depiction of new magistrate Tan is quite different in Lee Hejo's version. So he is kind of portrayed as a uh, kind of virile old man rather than brutal coiffed governor. So due to the influence of the source text, the treatment of Chunyang character is also very exceptional in Gale's translation. Particularly, Chunyang is not the stereotypical Kiseng. Uh, whether she is a kind of impeccable, impeccable woman equipped with all the virtues and knowledge, um, so we can see uh, the example of that. So in the scene, um, the flowers uh, wanted uh, now arrived at Chunyang's house. Uh, actually, not Chunyang's house, Wormes house. Uh, right with the new governor's order to bring, uh, bring Chunyang to the court. So, for example, the vernacular virgin, Chunyang and her mother kind of attempt to bribe them with warm meals and tokens, and the flowers found that kind of gracious treatment um, to be out of ordinary. Uh, to indicate this, the source material uses kind of sarcastic tone, um, insinuating Chunyang and her mother uh, attitudes kind of whimsical or superficial. But the translation is deprived of flower cynicism toward Chunyang. Rather, her generosity uh, is so impressive as to feel their souls. Um, oh, before that. And Chunyang's sense of morality also revealed in her relationship with Mong Yong. Um, I found the other presenters also noted uh, kind of sexuality or eroticism, but Chunyang is much more deprived in this translation in China or North Korean version or in the Japanese version. Uh, same goes with the English translation. Um, although Chunyang violates cultural norms regarding the premarital sex, and translation avoids drawing this attention to this more flaw, but not directly uh, mentioning her sexual relationship with Mong Yong. So the tra translation also attempts to present the Midnight Rendezvous as a formal marriage by titling the section Oriental Marriage. Although their commitment to marry is private and personal, the translation affirms that they initiate conjugal agreements by inserting the verbal commitment of Mong Yong. So in Gale's translation, uh, the detailed account of marital commitments uh, is very necessary to convey Chunyang's self-affirmation as a wife. And this consistency uh, makes for understandable and wholesome character of Chunyang, and such a clear mark of Chunyang's marital status enables the female characters to legitimize their claim as a formal wife before the new magistrate. Um, so story is permeated with the patriarch's pervasive power in shaping woman's life. Um, but Gail's version suggests 
Christian interpretation of the text as well. So for example, while Chunyang is in jail, she has a dream of drifting on the Xiaoxiang Xiao River, Tsosanggang, uh, where she encounters creatures of Chinese mythology. So in this quote, the Confucian concept of Hongbei in the very first line of Okjunga can envision as Christian concepts in Gail's translation. So the home bag refers to the human body and the soul. And it, it also denotes a type of souls in Chinese philosophy and Korean philosophy as well. Uh, so hon can represent spiritual, ethereal, and yang, and pe uh, can represent or connect with this idea of corporeal and substantive and in energy. But here the translator Gail connects the Confucian ideas to with the uh, more Christian concepts of the soul by transposing the indigenous concepts in the Christian rhetoric and expression. This kind of um, transposition is also found as a deliberate division of the chapter. So the 24 chapters were titled by the translator himself including conservative, uh, um, consecutive placement of chapters, such as in the final we see the feast and judgment and the world wreath. Um, so this kind of titles imply the parallelism uh, with the Christ's last meal, his suffering, and his victory after the crucifixion. So Gale's war goes beyond the mere translation um, in that it transformed the idioms to fit the Christian framework. So in contrast, the generally tolerant attitude towards indigenous form of Korean culture is also found in his account of kind of Buddhist, Buddhist worship and blind uh, for, uh, fortune teller scenes. But nonetheless, the text reveals the Christianization uh, of the Korean culture. So in Gail's hands, the tale of a Chunya is a reward and reshaped into a Christianized story uh, through the veneration and triumph of Chunyang as a sacred woman. Thank you, Phil. Thank you for your time.